thanks so much. I'll just put this to rest here um, and try and start on myself off without over talking to you. Um, yes, I thought it might grab your attention that I was an IDP in 1943. Um, although, of course, at the time, the phrase internally displaced person hadn't been devised because this was before the Second World War and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees and the Refugee Convention came a couple of years after the Second World War. It was one of the most important of the of a convention which included the Genocide Convention, of course, a genocide convention which was vital because of the aim of the Nazi regime which did succeed in destroying six million Jewish people in Europe. And I suppose that is actually why, a big reason why I am very deeply uh, angry. I guess I can say angry, yeah. That both the present government and the previous coalition government and the previous Labour governments stamped right the way through the Convention on Refugees. It's a terrible thing to do because after all, finally, each of us can become a refugee and that is not far-fetched at all. However, right now, I'll just fill in a few little things. Um, I'm married, kind of, and certainly in spirit and in terms of a ring, but not in terms of finance and all that rubbish. Um, <laughs> I'm married to a lovely Italian actor and I learned Italian because at school I had to choose between German and Italian and somehow I couldn't bring myself to study German language so I chose Italian and books were in such, such retrograde situation that I actually studied Italian at my girls' school from a book that had been produced during the fascist period of Italy. We were learning the fascist Italian language, which you'd be interested to know, but it's not our main subject, it was distinct in certain important ways from the pre-fascist era. Um, so I never learnt German. Later on, I came to feel very upset about that. I, the first UN um, post I took, feeling it was a great honour, and I still think it's a great honour, to be, uh, first of all, a special representative for UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, and then in 1995, an ambassador for the United Nations Children's Fund, and in 2006, and I think this is probably only, the only reference I'll make to films, <coughs> but you're welcome to ask about films later if you want. Um, I made a film with my son called Wake Up World, and I made it so both UNICEF members and young people, older people everywhere could know what is this United Nations Children's Fund? It was an extraordinary organization that came into being in 1946. And indeed, the very first international humanitarian relief, although it's also about development, not just emergency relief, uh, or not merely emergency relief, but the first action was bringing powdered milk to the children of Yugoslavia. 
and on it went. And some of the first things I did was go to Iraq just after the Gulf War and see the horror of what had been done to the hospital system and what was happening to the babies through malnutrition as well as disease. Very terrifying. And um, one, of, one of you who I met just before, while we were having a drink, um, was saying how two of his friends had been out in Afghanistan working with Médecins Sans Frontières. And I'm sure you know. And if you don't, you look it up that a US airstrike hit a Médecins Sans Frontières hospital in Kunduz, and a whole lot of the doctors and nurses and patients were killed. To me, that's fairly obvious argument against airstrikes. The other argument against airstrikes is, as I know from my own experience, why do people leave their homes? They only leave their homes if the bombs are beginning to look so threatening that you've got to get out of your home and that you've got to get away. And where do you get away to? In my case, it was in the lap of luxury because we had a cousin who lived up in Herefordshire, well away from, well away from um, London. Well, in the first place, my parents had rented a little farm um, and a whole lot of children from the east end of London were billeted on the farm. And my, one of my very first memories is actually sitting on my little chamber pot, surrounded by kids, so I didn't know who they were, who were fascinated to see me sitting on my chamber pot. Um, I felt a bit embarrassed, but at the same time, incredibly interested Anyway, that went, and we went up to Herefordshire, and there I saw the fire that consumed Coventry, the night of the big raids on Coventry, and the whole sky was red. We were in Herefordshire, Coventry, of course, is in Warwickshire, a good many miles away, but the whole sky was red. And I didn't remember that until I got to Sarajevo on behalf of UNICEF. I put forward a suggestion which UNICEF liked, and I went all over former Yugoslavia to the refugee camps and to children's institutes in Belgrade, in Croatia, Macedonia, Bosnia, of course, Sarajevo during the siege. And one of the terrifying distinctions of Sarajevo, as I learned from all my Bosnian friends, was that nobody was allowed to get out of Sarajevo. An agreement had been made, we'll keep everybody in, and then we won't have refugees. In spite of that, of course, some people did try to get out, and they'd get killed by the snipers in the mountains. And if you ever go to Sarajevo, I've just been there actually, see a wonderful production of a play directed by a dear friend of mine and acted in by some friends of mine, Croatian and Bosnian, Antigone by Sophocles. Um, more of that another time, wonderful. But uh, you will have some idea, of course, about Sarajevo. Time being as short as it is, and I see that we're already coming towards quarter past. What angers me especially and perturbs, I would say, say everyone, is that I know how impossibly difficult it was 
for Jewish refugees to gain shelter and refuge asylum in Britain. Quite a bit has been said recently about the kinder transport and eventually because of public opinion in Britain a kinder transport was organised and thank God 10,000 children were brought to Britain. It was impossible for anybody else to get into Britain and I'm going to read you a letter that was written by someone whose name is very familiar, even if you don't know history, especially now they've made a film called Suffragette. Sylvia Pankhurst wrote in November 1938 a letter to the News Chronicle, which was a progressive paper of the time. And I'm going to read it to you. It's very typical, but obviously I'm reading it to you because this is what I do a lot of, is I collect books. This is a penguin of the period. Should be more organized, shouldn't I? Um, So this is Sylvia Pankhurst, published in the, sorry, Manchester Guardian, November the 22nd, 1938. Now the Munich Agreement had been made in 1938, which betrayed the opposition in Germany and Czechoslovakia to Hitler. And prime in making that happen was the British government backed by the French government of the time. It's called, for some strange reason, appeasement. Actually, it was complete collaboration as far as I'm concerned, my point of view. Um, That coupled with refusing visas for refugees to come from the Nazis to come to Britain. This is Sylvia Pankhurst, a young Jewish lady, a university graduate of Vienna, was compelled to flee from that city when Austria was annexed, which it was in 1938. She took refuge in Rome where foreign Jews were not then persecuted because Italy was the only place to which for a long time it had been possible to remove German money. And naturally, she was obliged to take with her means of subsistence. She has now been ordered by the Italian authorities to leave Italy, but no country is willing to receive her. As she is known to me, I offered her shelter and pledged myself to the Home Office to maintain her so long as might be necessary. The Home Office has refused to allow me to receive her, on the ground that arrangements for her future are not definite and that Italy and Germany would probably refuse to have her back. I repeat, I pledged myself to maintain her as long as necessary. Miss Pankhurst goes on in the letter to relate a second case. Another young Jewish lady who is in this country is a talented musician and is desirous of continuing her musical studies here. That's in Britain in 1938. She has pledged herself not to accept paid or unpaid employment in this country in order that she may not displace a British subject. She has money coming through to maintain her from relatives in China, but apart from that, a lady who is the wife of a chancery barrister has pledged herself to maintain her, her, should it be necessary. Yet, she has been given notice to leave the country at an early date. When in cases such as these, obviously tragic, 
given the youth and refinement of these two girls, and so easily dealt with because persons are forthcoming to provide for them, permission to reside here is refused, what confidence can be placed in the suggestion that large-scale help will be given to the suffering people who are being driven out of Central Europe? May we not plead for somewhat more humanity in dealing with these cases? Now that is Sylvia Pankhurst in November 1938. There's one little thing that I noticed each time I read this book. I'll just leave it with you. Quote, members of the secret police or SS troops can be bribed to smuggle emigrants over a border without visa or passport. Some frontiers the girl found were more expensive than others. And in large German and Austrian towns, there was a sort of illegal stock exchange where the prices for human smuggling over the various borders rises and falls according to the vigilance of the frontier guards of the countries concerned. This method, however, is becoming increasingly difficult owing to the closer watch which is being kept on the frontiers. Jews are being turned back from the French, German, Swiss and Czech frontiers and their fate is usually a concentration camp. So that's just one little piece of truth about Britain's role and the refugees who tried to escape from Nazi, what was becoming totally Nazi Europe. Without claiming in any way parallel circumstances, um, refugees ah, I'm going to speak briefly about refugees, not only from Bosnia, where I was many times during the war, but also from Kosovo, where I was, um, working with my friends amongst the acting and musical communities. Uh, fantastic. All of them, of course, Albanian Kosovars, because Serbian Kosovars was a complete had been a complete apartheid regime in Kosovo. Um, different entrances if you were Albanian going to school in Kosovo than if you were a Serbian going to school in Kosovo. And I made a lot of friends in Kosovo, including a wonderful singer, one of those singers that can sing the highest that any soprano has ever sung. Her name, Nezhmiya Pagarusha. Um, and I met her the very first time I went. And I went out of the absurd, <laughs> but I think it's worth telling you because sometimes when things get so grim you can't bear it, up comes a marvelous bit of human endeavor and takes you by surprise. I'd been trying to get to Kosovo through putting into the Serbian embassy in London to get a visa. And of course they turned me down because I'd been speaking at public meetings, which I noticed socialists were not attending because Milosevic had been, a, guess what, a socialist. Who could take that for its face value? I don't know. Anyway. I got to Kosovo because I helped a Helsinki Human Rights Watch guy. Miss World or Miss Croatia had elected, yes, a Muslim beautiful girl to be Miss Croatia. And 
due to phone calls behind the scenes and no doubt a bit of money passing hands. The people in Miss World and Miss Croatia had said, no, 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 there was a mistake, there was a mistake. No, 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 this wonderful young Muslim girl has not won Miss Croatia. Um, no, 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 another lady has won, of course, was not Muslim and was blonde and very Slav and whatever. Anyway, the Helsinki Human Rights Watch committee guy said, come on, you help me, Vanessa. You're going to help me steal the crown. <laughs> and my God, we did. <laughs> he booked me into the hotel where the Miss Croatia television event was being organized. And he said, I'm going to get the crown and you're going to put it in your safe. <laughs> I said, OK. <laughs> so he got hold of the crown and it was put in my safe. And the moment came for the non-Miss Croatia to be crowned. But where was the crown? <laughs> the TV cameras were all ranged to crown the glorious blonde lady. I'd met, by the way, the lovely, beautiful Muslim girl, Croatian girl, who had been elected. So, of course, you know the story. You can't have crown somebody as Miss Croatia if you haven't got the crown. She just can't become Miss Croatia. So there was a total hue and cry, and uh, however, nobody could do anything about it. So finally, the real Miss Croatia did get crowned, not that night, and we sorted things out. And then I explained to my Helsinki Human Rights Watch friend, with whom I'd committed this terrible deed of thievery and robbery. Um, and I'd explained, I'm trying to get to Kosovo, and he said, oh gosh, I know, I've got a great friend who's at the Serbian consulate. I'll take you there and introduce to him. He's, he, he knows me and he's friends with me because I won't just say human rights are for one lot of nationalities and not for another lot of nationalities. So he respects me. So he took me and introduced me to the Serbian consul of that moment. And the Serbian consul stamped my passport and I got the next plane down to Skopje and made a few calls, of course. And a young actor got me into his car and we drove up to Pristina. And that's how I came to find the refugees in the mountains, to see the glints of the tanks that were hidden in the forests, to see the young Albanians with little rabbit guns and plimsolls, not even trainers, up in the mountains. And to meet some of the human rights lawyers who were later murdered by Serbian paramilitaries. People I'd known as well as hearsay, you know. And you know it makes a difference when you know people. It makes a huge difference when you know the mothers who've been forced to stand and watch while their husbands have been shot or had their throats cut. It makes a big difference. And there was a huge number of refugees were driven at gunpoint and I was out there with my friends. I don't remember the numbers. They were huge, driven at gunpoint down the railway tracks to the frontier with Macedonia. And oh, it was mud, it was rain, it was terrible conditions. UNICEF were terrific. They'd got some wonderful people locally in their offices who were very firm, very good. And uh, in about two and a half days, the German army built a camp for 30,000 in two and a half days. And it was pouring rain and snakes on the hillside, you name it. I've got a photograph to this day to remind me. 
and um, I sought the help of some of the Albanian artists in Macedonia, where there's a considerable Albanian population. And I said, I've heard that there's a man over 100 years old who's a refugee in Chegrani, was the name of the camp, and um, I must meet him. He was alive through every single war, including the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 and the First World War and on. So this wonderful Albanian actor went for me and I sort of trailed behind him with a transhaler we borrowed from UNHCR or one of the Save the Children or the Australian NGO Care. And he was saying, is anybody of the family named something or other? And eventually we located the tent and I stayed the night with the family and with the, the great-grandfather of the children and I spent the night with the women who were telling me what had been happening to them and how their fathers and uncles had carried this old man on their shoulders in the same way that the Greeks carried Aeneas from Troy after the defeat of the Trojans by the Greeks which you see very differently when you've been in those sort of areas. Now, it is now half past nine. I'll just conclude by saying um, that... Sorry. You might like to know this one last thing which is, I've done a little, very little work with the Refugee Council, I've collected for them from time to time, supported them, and of course was in touch with them since 2011, and got in touch with them again. And the coalition government cut the funds of the Ref British Refugee Council, the only nationwide organization built up over years for the registration, the finding of homes, the finding of legal advice and support, let alone all the other kinds, health and so on, of refugees. The funds were cut by 64% in 2011. Now, I ask myself, I don't ask you, maybe you can think of why. I just try and get my head around the fact that it was known what was happening already in 2011 and the only nationwide refugee organization had its funds cut by 65%. No more refugee center in Brixton, which was a terrific center, etc., etc. They work with the British Red Cross, and you know, the wonderful thing is that somehow or other, people who want to help, who do put human beings first and children first, find a way to somehow, somehow make things happen that should happen. Um, so, terrific things happening like Benedict Cumberbatch is making an announcement after every performance of his Hamlet down at the Barbican for put money in the buckets for Save the Children, which is very important. People everywhere are doing all sorts of things. My mind turns to the Refugee Council because it takes time to build up the kind of support that's needed if you're going to take care of even a small number. And we know how small the number is according to the intentions, the clear intentions of the present government. 
So that's it for now. Sorry, I ran over a couple of minutes. I beg your pardon. Um, open to questions, however you want to proceed, Robert. Thank you very much. Robert. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, that was extremely interesting. And I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and then open it up to the audience to carry on. And I suppose my first question is, um, what practical measures would you like to see David Cameron and other EU leaders taking to try and deal with the current uh, refugee crisis? Well, number one, of course, to agree to take the quota. I mean, that would be the bottom line, wouldn't it? Mm in my view. Um, that would be the most important one, be far from the end of the story, of course, but then the other thing would be funds, funding for the Refugee Council, and all this talk about, oh, the councils can be in charge of it all, hang on, they took away the council's right to keep the taxes that we pay to our councils so the councils haven't got spare money. So <laughs> it's a very tricky and intricate web of false statements from the government. Um, and it's interesting, though not at all happy-making, to see that the expressions of concern um, from the front benches of the present government are in no way different from the expressions of concern in 1938 from the Chamberlain government. Profound concern expressed, such as to make you want to vomit because they're not true, because they're said to deceive people. Basically, that my basic answer, but do follow through if you want. I mean, do you worry about um, you know, fundamental human rights issues being taken over by purely political um, considerations? What, like the Human Rights Act sure. being destroyed, which, which I know some of you don't think will happen, and I, it better not happen. It better not happen. It would be a disaster, an absolute disaster. And I can't now give another talk about why the destruction of our Human Rights Act would be a disaster, but it would be. And um, we must keep very careful, ears open, eyes open, not miss a thing, because it was in their manifesto to do it. And they keep saying, what we've put in our manifesto is what we're going to do. Well, I know there are a number of members of the MPs, and um, including that very good guy, Dominic Grave, who are very much against um, getting rid of our Human Rights Act. Um, so hold firm in there, but you never know what sudden catastrophe or disaster can happen that is misused in order to rush through legislation without people having quite the time to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on, get together, stop it. They're very good at that sort of thing. And um, linking in your career as a profound, world-famous actress, with your life as a political it's very kind activist. of you to say profound. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly my opinion. Um, Thank you. Sort of linking that in with your life as a political activist, do you think that there is a role, and if there is a role, what should that role be, for um, using the dramatic arts to educate about and campaign about political issues? Well... How can I say this um, to convey what I actually mean? 
Um, I don't think the arts should be used. The arts exist to give expression to longings, happenings, um, everything in a society. Now, I do think that some extraordinary work is being done. And it's very difficult for extraordinary work to be done when there's no funding for extraordinary work. And I do believe that funding for the soul, and I include the arts as being food for the soul along with anything else, and as important as food, I've, that's what I've always done, gone with the get together with the artists in any given place where I've been and we've done something to give. Um, in Kosovo, in the middle of Chigrani, I got a hold of a flatbed truck and persuaded somebody else from another NGO to provide a mic system and, um, and with my friends, the actors and musicians, we did an impromptu show for the refugee camp. I mean, it's normal stuff. Um, I met while in Kosovo um, and approached an Israeli NGO, which was there in adjacent to the camp providing shows for the children and asked if we could borrow a mic from them just for, we were doing our little bit in Albanian. Of course, I was just being silly and a clown, you know, because I don't speak Albanian. I wish, <laughs> but I don't. Um, and we all, and, we, and they said, yes, absolutely, we know who you are, so don't get into politics. I said, I won't, we're not here for politics, we're here to help the kids, so that's what we're going to do. And I'm glad you're doing it, and that's what I want to do, and it needs to be done. Um, I think I've strayed off the point, Robert. <laughs> Have I? Uh, that's quite all right. Um, final, final question for me for the moment. Um, are there any stage or screen roles that you would like to have played that you haven't yet had a chance uh, to play? Are stage roles? I would have loved, but can't still play. Oh, yes, thanks. Um, Queen Constance and King John. I've, I've performed the famous scene when she's discovered her Arthur is dead. Thank you so much, but um, I never can, obviously, since her son is nine years old. I can't play the queen. <laughs> <laughs> I have played Prospero, who is a refugee, of course. And I'm planning to make a little film with the help of Sands Films. Um, next year's summer anniversary of Shakespeare, I forget which. And I'm going to do a little film called Our Sea Sorrow, which is about, which will be woven around the scene in which Prospero tells his daughter how he was put in a boat that was destined to sink by his brother with the little girl, age three, and put out to sea to drown. And then there's, of course, the beginning of Twelfth Night, where Viola is in the sea storm and the ship gets wrecked and she says, what country, friends, is this? This is Illyria, lady. Alas, what should I do in Illyria, my brother? He is in Elysium. Now, fascinating thing for me, um, maybe that wonderful director, Lindsay Turner, I'll pass the word on. Illyria is the old name for Albania. And the Albanians say, 
that their civilization came before the Greek one. They have Mount Dodona, the Greeks have Mount Olympus. I think Mount Olympus is wonderful, I think Mount Dodona must be wonderful too. It's not for me to dictate or <laughs> deliver about this, but, and Viola is one of the Albanians' favorite names. So I kind of tend to think that Shakespeare must have traveled down the Adriatic and set foot in Illyria, where ancient custom, of course ancient doesn't exist now, but it still existed in the days of Rebecca West. If there's no son in the family, the eldest daughter assumes legally the role of the son, and wears masculine clothes, inherits, performs the marriages, etc., etc., etc. Pretty damn exciting, I think. <laughs> anyway, she's a refugee. So Shakespeare knew a bit about refugees, of whom, of course, there are a number in the Wars of the Roses cycle. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, we're going to open it now to questions from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, please put your hand up high and wait for the microphone to, uh, to come round to you. The lady on the front row behind the table. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, fascinating. Um, I would like to ask you, um, why do you think the um, majority of the population in Europe has been so unwelcoming to the refugees right now, um, after having in their living memory uh, all the horror from like Srebrenica and from what happened in, um, in the late 90s? In Srebrenica, and, did you say? Sorry? Did you refer to Srebrenica? Uh, yeah. Yes, I yeah. thought you did, thank you. Yeah, um, as in... Why do you think so many people in Europe don't want to be welcoming to the refugees? And I'm not talking about politicians, I'm talking about just normal people after having seen so much in the last years from like well, you such know horrors. What? And especially in the Balkans. I think the number of people who total hearts are with the refugees is far greater than the number of people who, numbers of people who are, you know, behaving as if they were the scum of the earth. The media are propagating this idea. And the media support, of course, the politicians. Who has ready ears, who can get the ready ear of the media anywhere in any country? the leading politicians, not the ordinary people who are flocking to do anything they can to help. I feel, yeah, I have to use the word lucky because I feel lucky to know so many people. They're, they're perfectly ordinary people insofar as I think you know, people in the arts are ordinary people, along with people in hospitals and health, and teachers. People are helping. The Greeks who haven't got a bean are helping. My Greek friends tell me so. They've got no reason to lie. But now and then we're getting the Independent on Sunday, October the 25th, gives a report from the island of Lesbos and the mayor, Galinos, apparently, if the paper's got its facts right, is a member of a right of center political party. His father was a partisan against the Nazis. Interesting. And he, on the island of Lesbos, is making sure that the thousands or landing on the northern coast are given help. 
as he says, we can't register because we haven't got the means. We haven't got the machines to do it. We've only got, we can do it by hand. We need, he said, the plastic. We, we've got a, we need a plastic recycling plant. It's very, very interesting. But as far as food and finding, uh, you know, refusing to be part of the, get rid of them, send them back. I mean, we've got a vampire in the phone office, in the home office, you know who I mean. Do I need to say the name? Shall I say the name? <laughs> She's not Hungarian either. I remember the Hungarian revolution. Because I left drama school to go to a refugee centre to help sort clothes, make cups of tea, and hold some of the women's hands. I couldn't speak Hungarian, but they knew that I was there just to say, oh, okay, I'm glad you're here, and I'm giving you a little cup of tea with some sugar. It's nothing, for goodness sake. I worked there for, for um, four months. I couldn't do anything else. I wanted to go out there and help. I couldn't even drive. I was a drama student, you know. But there was an outcry which you won't know about. The government at that time, conservative government, said that it would only take 2,000 Hungarian refugees. There was an absolute outcry. And my gosh, it hit the newspapers and the media. And the government was forced to give way. And I think they actually said 10,000 could come in at that point, and they came in at that point. But now we've got barbed wire going up everywhere. And the Hungarian government has built, I think it's 175 kilometer Razor wire fence between Serbia and Hungary. I don't know what. Um, I think I missed a few words of your question. You see, you see, it's the politics. When I joined UNICEF, I promised to put children before politics. It sounds so obvious, doesn't it? All children, any child, whoever. But you're hard put to find anybody in government who will put children before politics. Otherwise our children wouldn't be living in such terrible situations here, everywhere. Srebrenica was a crime. Somebody gave the order for the soldiers, not our soldiers, our UN soldiers, I'm saying our, not to lift their rifles. Um, I have to obviously, I don't know. You find out an awful lot when you're working under those situations and you find yourself negotiating with people who you know are murderers just to try and get a few a few things better for a f even very few children or whatever well, there are those who try and work to that effect, and there are those who don't, and the ones who don't are the politicians in the main. But even Paddy Ashdown, who was a military man, and I have respect for the military people, um, he couldn't get the money when he was High Commissioner of the Herzegovina, where most are. There's the main city in Herzegovina. He couldn't get the money. I, I talked to him one day quickly at an airport. We were all passing through. And he couldn't get the money from the European Union. 
And I know a girl who, hats off forever, one of the highly educated Bosnian graduate students. Right now she's helping refugees where in Croatia. Um, her body is still full of shrapnel from the war in her hometown, Mostar. You know, there's lives of young people. Some of them have still got their wits and their health and use everything they've got to, to help. They're, they're extraordinary, some of those young Bosnian students. And there are some Serbian students too from the Serbian student uprisings of, of way back. But Srebrenica, I imagine, I imagine that somebody's having nightmares pretty often who was responsible for that. I mean, we know the Serbians were responsible for the killings and the rapings that produced Srebrenica. But who gave the orders for UN people to do nothing and let it happen? What a crime. Needs a sort of Nuremberg, in my view. But today we'd say Nuremberg had to be for people to know. I think people need to know. That's why I think that trials are important. The rule of law is important. Not only the conventions, but everything else attached and connected to the conventions. Sorry, I tend to go on, I'm so sorry. That's all right, it's very interesting. Um, next question, could we go with uh, the gentleman right at the back of the chamber? Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for speaking here today. Um, my question is, um, if the public are so in support of helping refugees... Sorry, if what? If the public are so in support of helping refugees, then why do you think that the politicians aren't responding to this public pressure? That's a very good question. Well, do you think the politicians pay any attention to the public? I don't think... They do. You know, it's been somewhat accepted by the people who really think and write about these things that since the arrival, certainly it's dated, certainly from the arrival of President George Bush the Younger, that Intelligence has been shaped to fit politics and not the other way around. Politics changed going with intelligence. Now intelligence covers an awful lot of areas and I think one would have to be crazy to not realize that you have to have intelligence services and they're needed. But if you know that, and you're working in intelligence, that you're only going to keep a job, let alone advance, if you say whatever the politicians want, then we're kind of F-U-C-K-E-D, aren't we? <laughs> That's the best I can come up with, you know, just without getting into a longer discussion, which would be important. I don't know why. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Could we go with the, uh, the gentleman on the, on the front row over here? Um, you spoke about the sort of inefficacies of the UN and um, the case of um, what happened during um, you know, the crisis in Kosovo. 
It's not the only time, the first time or the last time that the UN has sent peacekeeping soldiers into an area and they've sort of let, you know, huge scale massacres happen. Rwanda was another example. Do you think this is a structural problem with the UN? Do you think something needs to be... Sorry, do I think what? This is, why is it that the UN seems incapable sometimes of really just doing anything when there's a crisis going on and people die? Well, very often it's the Chinese government. That's what I've heard from within the UN. They've said, if you get onto a subject that the Chinese are not happy about, you won't get it through. That's one answer which isn't satisfactory, but I believe to be true. Um, Recognising that the majority of governments are awfully corrupt these days, not all of them, but the majority We lost Mandela, superb guy. We lost Desmond Tutu, still alive, thank goodness. We lost Havel in Czechoslovakia. God knows there's some various other people going around to Europe, the European governments. And I've been reading a book which is really filling me, filling me in. It was last published it's a paperback written in Italian, Al Sud di Lampedusa, and the guy who wrote it is an Italian journalist who writes for Manifesto. Um, he's been all over, going further and further south in Africa to find out the actual facts about the desperate surges to get out, get out across the Mediterranean to get to Europe. Um, and it's really, really well written. It's helped me see an awful lot of things that the press reports are written so hurriedly and people who really don't know are writing. And the people who do know who were writing, I don't know what's happened to them, then they've been sidelined somehow. Um, because, of course, coming across, we are so focused on Syria, but how many wars have there been and are there? Nigeria being one, obviously, which we're not hearing about at all. Um, and I think it's pretty damn obvious that black faces are less welcome on the Mediterranean, even less welcome than Syrian white faces. I think it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Um, British government holds a huge responsibility because we're selling arms all over, which are being used against civilians all over the place. God, somebody once said Britain is a nation of shopkeepers. I think it was a long time ago. Well, now it's the shopkeepers of the world have united to take power in Britain. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. We don't have the rights anymore that we used to have as citizens when everything is owned by foreign conglomerates and foreign governments. The waters of Africa, I think, have virtually all been bought up by China. Well, they're thinking ahead, obviously. And where, what about the people? Remember when my daughter went to Kenya, she said the factories which produce peas and vegetables and things as well as flowers are surrounded by razor wire. I mean, excuse me, hello. I'm sure you 
You know, you all don't need me to be pointing these things out. But I'm just, so I'm just kind of telling you what's on my mind. Thank you. And we'll go for one final question uh, from the, the lady in the scarf in the third row. Um, you seem to have a lot of passion about the refugees, and I think, what, would you have any advice to pass on to us the things that we could do to make a difference in the world and help the problem? That you can do as students? Just us, yeah, as a generation of young people, what could we do to make a difference? Well, of course, there's a lot you can do. Um, an awful lot. You know, I would be, have to be up to you, or wouldn't it, as to what you do? I think there might be some rooms available somewhere in Oxford. You know, never mind how many. Be a good start for some families to be officially welcomed, you know, by the students and make a pledge to keep the families and what the basic needs, you know, and check out what the council is doing. I don't know what the Oxford Council is doing. And you've all got exams, and I don't know what, haven't you? And that's a big deal. Um, they're trying to make sure that everybody's got about as many exams as you could possibly <laughs> um, Any funds that you can raise, you know, you'd have to decide. I, I'm personally wanting to raise funds and make a film for the British Refugee Council because I know it and because I want people to know it should be restored as a nationwide organization. Um, but I'm not, you know, it's, I wouldn't say, well, choose this, save the children rather than the British Red Cross or whatever, you know. You, you've got to check it out yourselves, haven't you? And check out what you... What do you think? I mean, clothes, winter clothes. It is freezing in the Middle East as we go on now to more and more towards winter. Freezing rain and freezing snow. So, I know a wonderful guy. He is taking it from the soul point of view. I know a wonderful guy, he's a composer, brilliant composer. We've worked together and I'm very happy to know him. He's just finished setting up a music course with children in a Syrian refugee camp or a refugee camp for Syrians, which is actually in um, Jordan. And he's had to leave it. Uh, but he's left in place some adults or near adults who are going to continue the work of the program that he set up. And you know that Jewish saying that I personally only learnt from Schindler's List, the film. You know, whoever saves one life saves the world. We can't think of how little we're doing, but just, just do the best we can. And it makes, it changes, everything changes more than we can conceivably know. But, there we are. I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening, but please join me in thanking Vanessa Redgrave. <laughs>